Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Marina Garcia Granero. She is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Valencia in Spain. She is a former postdoc from the Institute of Philosophy at KU Leuven in Belgium, where she worked in 2022 as an associate member of an ERC project titled Homo Memeticus. Her research and teaching areas are Friedrich, Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy, ethics, and feminist philosophy. She is currently researching Nietzsche as a mimetic precursor and his legacy within mimetic studies. And today we're talking about Nietzsche, of course, uh, his concept of Zuchtung, biopolitics, incorporation, race, the geneal genealogical method, and other related topics. So, Marina, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. I'm very happy to be here. So, I mean, one thing that I find really interesting about Nietzsche's work is that, or body of work, is that um, different people interpret it in many different ways. So why do you think that's the case? That's a great question to start with. This wide range of interpretations happen with many authors, but obviously it's less intensely than in the case of Nietzsche. And I think there are at least two main factors at play. The first one is Nietzsche's style as a writer, as, as a philosopher, the fact that he wrote most of his books in aphorisms or section makes it easier for many people to clip and copy paste one or two sentences, isolate them from the rest of the argument and create a new whole narrative from there, while obviously overlooking Nietzsche's point. And sentences with provocative, shocking vocabulary and many metaphors will be of, uh, of the target of this strategy. And Nietzsche was very much aware of the dangers of his writing style. And he repeatedly stated in his test that his, reader, his readers should ruminate his books. So it is crucial, in my opinion, to read the text in their entirety to capture whether he's claiming something, whether he's just presenting a hypothesis, an experiment of thought, whether he's being ironic, that's also sometimes the case, and we need to pay attention to the text and read between the lines. And I also think that this wide range of interpretations is also prompted by the fact that in Nietzsche's works, we often find positive and negative statements about any topic. For example, he values certain aspects of democracy, while well, obviously critiques many others. The same happens with feminism or women's emancipation, as it was called back then. And so, his interpreters will always favor one side of the issue and ignore the other, depending on their beliefs or philosophical commitments. And that's why we have right with Nietzsche, left with Nietzsche. We have modern, postmodern, feminist, misogynist, the political, the apolitical, the transhumanist, among many other portrayals. And in my opinion, we should refrain from labeling Nietzsche as a philosopher or as a man with causes and categories that he did not use and uh, didn't originate maybe in his time. And I don't think serious Nietzsche scholarship does this, but outside of specialized Nietzsche scholarship, it is the case that uh, sometimes scholars project their agenda onto Nietzsche. So we should not only be reading between Nietzsche's lines, we should also be looking at the fingers of whoever is interpreting Nietzsche, and especially enabling Nietzsche. And how can we avoid this, in my opinion? Well, uh, Mazzino Montinari, one of the editors of the canonical German edition, argued that reading Nietzsche always leads to elements that stand outside the text. And we must pay attention to them. For example, Nietzsche's life, his experiences, his sources, his readings, and how he, they influence him. The point is that uh, the text is part of a larger reality that we need to consider to elaborate the most plausible interpretations and ensure that we as scholars are not projecting anything onto Nietzsche and that obviously our, under, our understanding is historically accurate because we cannot exchange Nietzsche's reality as a German in the 19th century with our reality. And uh, I think there are two different tasks. The first 
being a careful study of Nietzsche's philosophy, that is paying attention to all sides of his arguments and not just what benefits us. And the second is obviously using some of his concepts and ideas later as inspiration for our philosophical commitments. And those are both valid and valuable tasks, but they are different. So any scholar should be very clear separating where Nietzsche ends and where uh, their own ideas begin as scholars. What is Nietzsche? What is not Nietzsche? What is the product of our input and of our thoughts? And I think many more contemporary scholars are doing this very well. So obviously there's a lot of hope for the future. <laughs> right. <laughs> And looking across uh, Nietzsche's body of work, I mean, traditionally people have divided it in, into this conventional, let's say, tripartite division. Uh, the young Nietzsche or his Wagnerian phase, the positivist or enlightened, enlightened Nietzsche, and the mature Nietzsche. Do you think that that tripartite division makes sense or do you find that there's perhaps more intellectual continuity across Nietzsche's works uh, than people have traditionally thought? Well, I think the perspective of continuity provides great advantages to understand Nietzsche as a philosopher than the conventional uh, tripartite division. In fact, Nietzsche understood his intellectual development as a coherent path. This clearly shows in many texts. For example, the prefaces that he added in 86 and 87 to the aphoristic books, which are Human to Human, Daybreak and the Gay Science. The other books are written in sections, so not aphorism. And likewise, the attempt at a self-critique, that's a prologue that Nietzsche wrote to include in, in a new ed edition of his first book, The Birth of Tragedy. Mm -hmm. 14th uh, years later. And that attempt serves to understand Nietzsche's intellectual itinerary. And it is also vital for him to shed light on his past claims, especially on pessimism. Because Nietzsche, obviously, as he, as he grew, as he advanced, he revisited several shortcomings in light of new arguments and circumstances. In fact, in the prologue of uh, Human to Human, the, the other prologue, I mean, he wrote that his writings spoke only of his overcomings. So he is understanding his own books as overcomings in a coherent path. Mm -hmm. No, not rupture. And he had this agonistic attitude toward himself as a philosopher. As a philosopher, he was constantly revisiting his ideas and saying yes to this, no to this. He was reaffirming some ideas, abandoning others that he now found incorrect. And the only phase that Nietzsche recognizes is the Wagnerian phase with that word, phase. And he does so in two letters to friends. He wrote that with respect to the phase of the last 10 years of his life, he approved it as a whole, but he now knew a higher point of view. That's it. That means he accepted the phase. He recognized it as necessary to achieve a better perspective. And I think we need to be aware that these distinctions of divisions are a narrative that we scholars have created. But there are no three different niches. There are no radically different philosophies. And these uh, distinctions sometimes give the impression to people outside of Nietzsche's scholarship that Nietzsche is someone that is constantly contradicting himself. So it comes with these disadvantages. But the truth is that there is one life and one philosophy in development. We can use periods for pragmatic purposes. They allow us to communicate. If I say the aphoristic books, everyone knows what I mean. They, uh, we can use them to organize our Nietzsche's books in volumes, think about texts that share problems and approaches, but they are an artifact of the scholarship. These, uh, these periods should not become a dogma. And some people have objected that this perspective that I have necessarily entails assuming that Nietzsche would have a system or some systematic philosophy like Kant. And no, there is no system, but there is at least an overarching project. And in my opinion, reading Nietzsche under the presupposition that he was a person experiencing his life, having an intellectual itinerary, and like any of us, changing his mind of some issues, 
uh, implies that there is no system. There's just a coherent development. And just a few words to contextualize my interest on this issue. This dogma of discontinuity has provided argumentative support to scholars who have wanted to undervalue or hide the question of Zuchtung or breeding cultivation in Nietzsche's philosophy, which is the topic that I dedicated my dissertation to. And they have presented that some random occurrence in, on, of his last text, mainly the Twilight of the Idols, almost as if it were an inappropriate idea of Nietzsche on, on the verge of madness, because he obviously lost consciousness in January of 1889. But this view is incorrect in two levels. Firstly, because the term Zuchtung appears since 1873, with the note in which he paraphrases Walter Budget, an economist that was heavily influenced by, oh, sorry, heavily influenced by evolutionism. And that note, uh, just as an example, describes nationality as a type of breeding. And it is worth stressing that in 1873, Nietzsche was 29. It is one year after the birth of tragedy, his first published book. And so, uh, secondly, as I said, this division into three phases is not how Nietzsche thought of himself. And that's why I started my dissertation with a chapter on this topic, Nietzsche's self-assessment to neutralize this prejudice. And then I published it in Studios Nietzsche, the Spanish journal for Nietzsche studies, in case anyone is interested. Great, so you, may, you mentioned the concept of Zustung there at a certain point, which in English should translate into something like breathing or cultivation. So mm -hmm. tell us more about it. What is Zustung in Nietzsche's philosophy? Yes. So my main argument is that, this, is, is that this notion of breathing serves as an analytical tool for him to examine and evaluate cultural and subject formation. And these terms, I'm going to go into, I'm going to enter into some uh, terminological discussion, but I think they're important. So yeah. it, it encompasses a whole, a, a wide semantic field in Nietzsche's philosophy. So, and by this I mean that depending on the, the message, the paragraph, it may sometimes mean breeding, cultivation, discipline, domestication, taming, natural or artificial selection, also conquation, child rearing, but it is all meant to capture how different cultures shape different forms of life, mm -hmm. or radically they breed different types of human beings. And so this vocabulary is obviously very troubling, but I think as scholars, we should be able to come to terms with it in Nietzsche's text and handle it with care. It does not mean that we will later go <laughs> about our lives using it, but when studying Nietzsche, we need to understand why he's using it and what his purpose was. And so my interpretation differs from uh, previous treatments that are usually polarized in that they interpret breathing as either brutal hygienical program or as a simplified, merely cultural synonym for education. Those are the two poles that we usually find. And so, in my opinion, uh, breathing is a formative process that connects biology, Nietzsche often said physiology, morality, politics, and even aesthetics. And because what he's doing is that he's discussing the physiological scope of our culture, of religions, morals, values, and as I said, uh, art is also part of this process. Art comes from aesthetics, sensation, and Nietzsche stated more than once that aesthetics is nothing more than applied physiology, that taste is a selective process because it's, it establishes a threshold of what is acceptable, what is not, what fits, what fits our bodily sensations, what doesn't. Tastes are not easily changed. And art also communicates interpretations that we incorporate as affects. And this example is interesting because Nietzsche speaks of Wagner's art multiple times with these terms, positively and negatively. In 1875, so again, very young Nietzsche, he's idol idolizing Wagner, and he writes that Wagner breeds his audience. This is a posthumous note. And so, but he's conveying that Wagner's influence is powerful, and his uh, music has a formative impact 
on the spectator's constitution. However, in his, line, in his last books, like the case of Wagner, he again uses these terms, but now to criticize him. So the wars themselves, they are not necessarily positively or negatively charged. It depends on the ends of the breeding or cultivating process. Because after breaking up with the Wagnerian phrase, phase, sorry, and the cause of the Wagnerian cause, Nietzsche goes as far as to state that the Wagner's art, Wagner's art, sorry, uh, coincides with the political interest of the German Empire, the Second Reich, that it serves as a political instrument because it cultivates physiological affects that ensure a, a dressage, a taming, a training and discipline. And Nietzsche warns of this instrumental power of Wagner's art for German nationalism. He says that Wagner's art fulfills the definition of the German and at the same time promotes it. It promotes the development of Germans. And he writes, obedience and log lengths, which is obviously very funny, but uh, <laughs> we, we have both things. We have you know, the moral value and the physiological constitution. And so uh, this is ex uh, a good example because it shows that there is a circular relationship between a, a cultural product and a people, the people that appreciate, that enjoy that cultural product that there is a compatibility, physiologically speaking, between a work of art and a spectator, and that ensures the success. Germans enjoy Wagner's art because it speaks to their instincts as Germans. And so that's why the overall conclusion from Nietzsche's use of breathing, I think, is that uh, these processes, these, uh, these are bringing this cultural formation should not be left to chance or neglected, or, or neglected, because others will instrumentalize it, like Wagner, like the Second Reich. So we should be taking care of it. And many of our listeners might be thinking, oh, I read Nietzsche back in my high school or college, and I don't remember not this in this term, other than in the Twilight of the Idols. And so I think that's the most prevalent misinterpretation of Zürtung, which is to reduce it to that distinction of morality of, of taming, which is Christianity, and the morality of breathing, which is the Code of Manu. And in 1888, again, Nietzsche's last year of intellectual sanity. Because but the thing is that uh, that's the text, the only text in which translators, traditionally in most languages or any other, uh, were forced to use breathing and taming instead of education, discipline, or, or any other term without these animal connotations. Translators couldn't use morality of education in a chapter where Nietzsche writes that only these terms, these zoological terms, that's the term that he used, the, only these zoological terms express realities. It was impossible to talk about education there. But in the rest of Nietzsche's corpus, many scholars and translators have opted for different words to refer to Zuchtung, as I said, uh, depending on the context. Sometimes the broader term selection, sometimes discipline, also cultivation. It is very liked because it has this botanical uh, meaning, connotations instead of animal. And the fact is that many scholars have reserved breathing to the strongest passages where there really was no alternative. There was really no other word to use. And also some scholars speaks of flourishing, even if Blumen only appears 10 times. So. All of this has promoted that uh, Zuchtung and breathing have acquired a very negative reputation, a sense, because many people are unaware that any time they read cultivation, uh, cultivation raise, uh, raising the sense of raising children, for example, educating or inculcating, if they were to look at the original text in German, for example, inculcating in uh, the case science uh, 111, that's Zuchtung. So if they were to look at the German text, there is an occurrence of Zuchten or Zuchtung. So the better choice for us scholars, I think, is to always work with a good recent translation and the original side by side. But thankfully, as time passes, as Nietzsche's scholarship advances, new editions are progressively displaying this concept instead of trying to conceal it. Most recent uh, English translators, for example, Judith Norman or Adrian Del Caro, 
tend to, tend to showcase the term with either breeding or cultivation. Okay, and so we need to be able to tackle these terms instead of hiding them under the carpet. Because if we pay attention to them, to Nietzsche's context and to his goal, it becomes evident that he did not have any Nazi eugenical project in mind. It, and it's important to note also, and with this I will finish my answer to this uh, very long question, uh, my very long answer uh, to this important question, that it, it's important to note that Nietzsche did not coin the concept. And for example, if we uh, consult the German Green Dictionary the, of the Green Brothers, the term mostly means animal reproduction regulated by humans. But it also refers in a properly human sense to severe education, to discipline and to punishment. In fact, before the 19th century, a Tuchtar uh, uh, was a teacher or an educator, usually with these connotations of, very, uh, of severe or severity. A Zugmeister is an educator, a disciplinarian, and Nietzsche praises Schopenhauer, in Schopenhauer as an educator, again, an early book, with, uh, this, with these terms, positively, obviously. And he also uses this archaic sense which he refused to his disciples as Zürchlige. He uses Zucht instead of discipline, Zürchtige for punishment instead of the more common word, which is Bestrafen. So uh, Nietzsche is a master of nuances. And uh, it's important to understand and pay attention why is he so insistently using these terms? That's my point. And so um, I think I'll leave the and then I'll continue with another question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk now a little bit about how this all relates to politics and Nietzsche's politics specifically. And then we also will also have other concepts of Nietzsche's work and how we thought about certain concepts that we commonly use uh, mm -hmm. and how also they connect to perhaps <coughs> some aspects of even contemporary politics. But to start off with, how does the concept of Zustung apply to biopolitics? So uh, it's interesting to note that First of all, that Züchtung has two genealogies that intertwine as influences in Nietzsche. And they are both those two genealogies, which, which are evolutionism and Plato. They are both recognized as biopolitical precursors, for example, by Roberto Esposito, a major philosopher of um, biopolitics, and also uh, uh, Michel Foucault. And for in Greek society, for example, the body of a slave people was the, pro the property of, their, of a slave owners. Mm -hmm. That's via politics, for example. And so yeah. I will first say a few words on these two genealogies and then talk a bit about how later uh, biopolitical thinkers have understood this. So, for example, regarding the first uh, genealogy, the evolutionary genealogy, it is prompted by the fact that the first translation, the first German translation of the origins of, of species, Darwin's uh, The Origin of Species, yeah. to German, use Naturliche Züchtung to translate natural selection. And so this prompted that the word was, uh, be became obviously part of the cultural talk and scientific talk. And this crystallizes in passages of uh, in Nietzsche's notebooks, where he quotes authors like Lange, Heckel, During, and evolutionary uh, thinkers using Zuchtung uh, in this sense, natural selection. And this was later changed in posterior editions, but uh, anyways, it made an impact. And, but, and there's also a second genealogy behind this term, which is more educational, and it's Plato. Uh, of the, and in my opinion, and the, the relation between uh, Nietzsche and Plato is always uh, a nuanced topic, because he's always uh, for and against Plato. So, in my opinion, what Nietzsche does not share with Plato is Socratism. It's uh, ascetic dualisms, his content for the body and the apparent world, which uh, the apparent world for Nietzsche is the only world, is the only real world. And so, it is also common knowledge that Nietzsche defined his philosophy as inverted Platonism to reject uh, his metaphysics, but he also characterizes Plato as the first philosopher who attempted 
to reform the world. So he's uh, praising him. Mm -hmm. And it gradually becomes apparent that, I, to, in my opinion, it's very clear that his objections always concern Socrates. It, 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 in fact, Nietzsche wrote that Socrates corrupted the most beautiful plant of antiquity, Plato. And so what's the link with Zuchton? The link is that uh, in the Republic, the statesman, the laws in, in these uh, uh, Plato's writings, and it, Plato uses Greek terms such as egloge, which is selection, and trophe, breathing, uh, in a, to refer to humans, to designate an educational task. So like Nietzsche, he's using animal terms to understand how to form good natures that uh, assisted with education will gradually become uh, better than the preceding ones. And uh, there are constant analogies with animals. And so this previous uh, genealogy before the uh, evolutionary thinkers is crucial for Nietzsche. And it has been stressed especially by uh, uh, scholars such as Henrik Othman, who have uh, uh, emphasized this educational uh, side of Züchtung. So now we're jumping ahead to contemporary philosophers who have either directly discuss the question of Zuchtung or incorporated the echoes. And so I want to stress two ideas. The first one is that uh, Nietzsche does not suggest a previously non-existent phenomenon of breathing. He's redefi redefining, reorienting, redirecting a formative process already underway in society. Like these processes are happening whether we are aware of it or not. We, I already spoke about the example of nationality, how uh, the national character of a group becomes physically visible, for example, because uh, the, the, it's, uh, moral cultural characters are uh, cultivated. And so what Nietzsche, Nietzsche suggests is that there are social and natural processes leading to the creation of very homogeneous groups of people and that human development should be more open to difference. And that's his crucial critique of the European civilizing process, especially when he talks of taming. And when, and when he compares uh, the European civilizations with the domestication of dogs out of wolves. And this is again a platonic metaphor. And so Nietzsche is urging people, individuals, to stand on their own without the shelter of the herd the pack, and that's why careful self-cultivation is the only therapeutic response to these mass processes. And uh, now concerning the question directly and how it has impacted uh, biopolitics in the 20th century, there is an increasing amount of Nietzsche specialists that hint at the possibility of locating a seed of this biopolitical thought in Nietzsche's philosophy. And for example, prominent Nietzsche scholar Andreas Ursomar suggests that today, instead of Züchtung, we talk about biopolitics. And he states so in a, a, vol a volume called Nietzsche Commentar, a commentary for Beyond Good and Evil, which is a major resource for Nietzsche scholarship. And this association, of course, implies a synonym, a synonym, an affinity between the terms, because Nietzsche continuously stressed the interrelation between politics and biology, bi biological life. And that's why he represents an essential president for biopolitics. He anticipated this idea that power penetrates life. And so uh, he was a forerunner in the sense that he foregrounded phenomena of power that later became crucial for, for example, Michel Foucault, Roberto Esposito, Giorgio Agamben, uh, Peter Sloterdijk. He anticipated the awareness that many of the elements that we consider most intimate about our lives are the product of a particular cultural recipe. And so I will start, I will say a few words on three of these authors, Foucault, Esposito, and Sloterdijk. As far as I know, there is no information on how Foucault read Nietzsche. And by this, I mean the editions he used. But mm -hmm. it is very likely that because of the history of Nietzsche's editions and their translations to French, he did not notice the term Züchtung itself. Because, for example, uh, like in English, like in Spanish, only after uh, Patrick Votling's works, the uh, a translator, uh, as a Nietzsche scholar, a translator, only after him did French editions start using eleva, elevage, 
as a translation for Zuchtung. So, uh, I don't think Foucault captured the term, but I think there's no doubt that he absorbed and incorporated the echoes, the messages. For example, the idea that bodies are situated, disciplined, marked, immersed in a political field, all of this has a very Nietzschean heritage. Foucault's vocabulary is heavily influenced by Nietzsche, not only uh, by the method of uh, genealogy, but also uh, all the animal images and bodily wording that we find in Foucault. And so, and I, I, I think that Foucault had the same uh, concern and goal to control and limit the scope of power. Foucault contemplated uh, counter to, uh, for example, to, uh, to have discipline, to have power over oneself, for example, to transform ourselves and develop another way of being. This in Foucault is called care of the self. And uh, sec now, secondly, so there is an important niche and inspiration, but there are also important differences, which I'm not going to enter here. Uh, I published an article in Spanish on uh, the presence of uh, Nietzscheanism in biopolitics, and there I go into all of detail. I think the, the clear forerunner uh, of this portrayal of Nietzsche as a key figure for biopolitics is Roberto Esposito, because he vindicated the importance of Nietzsche's philosophy for the ulterior development of biopolitics as a philosophical current. In fact, he asserted that all Foucauldian categories are present in a nutshell in Nietzsche's language. So uh, everything in Foucault, you can already find it in Nietzsche. He goes as far as to say that. And uh, Foucault, for example, uh, uh, makes some connections between what he calls the immuni immuni immunitary paradigm, paradigm, which is the idea that uh, uh, every society wants to protect itself against alleged enemies. And Nietzsche already said that this instillment of fear, this taming, this uh, comes at the cost of many sacrifices and limitations because we they are then trained to function per the needs of our society and become the function of the herd. And so uh, biopolitics uh, in Nietzsche it, also, it already shows that it's always at the risk of becoming thanatopolitics, which is politics of death. That, that this means, uh, in broader terms, that societies can be manipulated to think that the death of their supposed enemies will improve their own quality of life. This is already Nietzsche. And uh, Esposito is wonderful in displaying this. And he also captured the double biopolitical character of Zuchtung, how it functions beyond good and evil, for good and ill, how it has a critical meaning, when, for, especially when Nietzsche criticizes the European civilizing process, and also how it has, as, so it, sorry, how it has a positive dimension, uh, let's say a futuristic, a hopeful meaning, as a hopeful project of what type of humans could, be, uh, could appear in the future. And so he was also very intelligent in capturing that. And also, uh, Peter Stroterdijk, uh, uh, this is well known, in Rules of the Human Zoo, which was a very provocative book. He uh, talked about Nietzsche's breathing, and I think there are some uh, correct uh, aspects in his interpretation and some incorrect ideas. But, and so, that's also for people to read if they're interested. And it, but breathing has also some links to his idea of anthropotechnics, of how humans are formed. And so all of these are exciting examples of philosophical proposals, but we need to remind ourselves that they are posterior and extrinsic to Nietzsche. They're not Nietzsche. They have incorporated Nietzsche's philosophy as a perspective, and to me, uh, that's a virtue. And they use his concepts and contribution to examine uh, their, their advantages for the present without claiming that they are equivalent to Nietzsche. To me, that's, uh, as I said in my answer to the first question, that's, that's key. Uh, and so there are some current political and social issues to which people apply biology. Uh, according to what you were just saying, 
I mean, does Nietzsche's takes on, or do Nietzsche's takes on biopolitics connect in any way to that? Well, uh, it's not so much how people apply biology, mm -hmm. but the idea that politics in itself has essential biological dimensions and requirements. So, okay. or with your words, we could say that uh, in politics, we are always doing biology, and some, sometimes uh, you're right. But the, the idea is that uh, biopower, the, the term which is broader than biopolitics, uh, is the awareness that many social problems have unavoidable biological components. For example, to properly function, a society requires uh, that, the individ that the individuals are healthy, that the population is healthy. Uh, that capitalist societies, or any society for that matter, there are concerns with demography, the ratio of birth to death, there are concerns with uh, retirement, how to pay for pensions, mm -hmm. they're concerned with uh, epidemic diseases, public health, especially illnesses that expel people from the workforce, also issues of urbanism, ecology, and that's what uh, Foucault called, uh, called population regulation. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the idea is that uh, biopolitics operate on the, operates on the population, understanding it as a multiple body and uh, aiming at an equilibrium, at a regulation. And so this is obviously crucial for capitalism because the, it needs to incorporate bodies into the workforce constantly. And Foucault also wrote ab about uh, the body as a machine. It's training, dressage, again, an animal term, and to increase the abilities of workers of, uh, workers and their force and their docile integration into efficient and economic uh, control systems. So, but we need to remind ourselves that biopower is not an obscure idea or an extreme dangerous form of, of power. It is something which for us has become ordinary Public health policies, for example, are an example of biopower. And we obviously now think of COVID-19, but not just the management of epidemics. Things as normal as what vaccines need to be financially covered by public health care. That's an issue of biopower. So biopower, it's, it's like Surtout. It needs to be used primarily in a descriptive sense to analyze and become aware whether the choices that we're making, for example, with this policy or financing this uh, medicine and not this other medicine, for example, no. And so these are dynamics that have characterized our societies for several hundred years. And the question is, how can, one, how can we ensure that these policies are less authoritarian and as democratic as possible? So, and to end with this, uh, it is also important to remember that power is not only is never exclusively held by the state. There are also multiple institutions and social functions that carry power. Nietzsche wrote a big deal about the Christian church and how it breeds a gregarious animal. Foucault analyzed hospitals, schools, the military, the police, prisons, asylums, factories. So just like Surtout, biopower and biopolitics, they can be used for good and ill. They operate as a circle, and it can be both vicious and virtuous. And another thing I would like to ask you about is how Nietzsche uses the concept of race in his work. So what role does it play there, and what exactly does he mean by race? That's a very interesting question. So. <laughs> Uh, Nietzsche uses uh, race more than 200 times. So uh, it's natural that we, uh, after some time, we wonder what does he mean by it? <laughs> yeah. And so what's a commonplace term in natural science, in epistemology, sorry, in anthropology and humanities. And, but he in particular uh, uses race in a multitude of ways that are completely different from how we now use it. For example, and these are simply examples from uh, Beyond Good and Evil, just Beyond Good and Evil. In Beyond Good and Evil, he speaks of vain conceited races. He speaks of Latin races. He speaks of governing races. 
he claims that the English are not a philosophical race. This is in Beyond Good and Evil 252. For example, today nobody would say that the English are a race. No. And so for this reason, uh, scholars such as Gershank, I already called him, I think, he wrote an extensive monograph in German titled uh, Rasse und Zuchtung bei Nietzsche, so race and breeding in Nietzsche, in the 2000s. He argues that by race, uh, Nietzsche actually means something more like ethnicity, because he labels as races many social groups that we now could never consider as such. And obviously, there could be many ethnicities within what we now call a race. In any case, Nietzsche understood race as a product of physiological, environmental, cultural, and also political factors. So race for Nietzsche is not an origin, it's a result. It's the culmination of a process of us just, uh, adjusting to an environment and incorporating certain instincts through, uh, all, like always, culture, religion, morality. So race, in Nietzsche's sense, is a people, like in, in the German folk, a people, a group of people who live in a community for a long time in a specific environment. And ultimately, they develop specific traits. They develop their own physiology and values, their own morals, they all, they, their own ways of living. So he sees this as uh, the reality of race as a phenomenon. But precisely because it is a phenomenon and not an essence, it is changing. He did not understand race or racial identities in terms of bloodlines or pure bloodlines. Because race for Nietzsche is something that becomes. It's not something original. In fact, it is in uh, resides. It, it resides and it, it is transmitted by the body. And so the basic phenomenon, the root, we might say, is the body. It's not race. It's the interconnection and the interrelation between our body and, for, and for example, our environment, our family, uh, and our culture. And so there is no static, stagnant nation of racial identity. And so, in fact, when Nietzsche talks about races, and he usually, uh, and, the, and the qualities, the qualities of races, he usually talks about uh, virtues or vices, but, but by this I mean moral virtues and moral vices. For example, he, he calls the ancient Greeks a race. We will never do that now. And he claims they had good taste, they, they had beauty, they had self-control, while the English, again, <laughs> he criticizes them because, the, because of their utilitarian philosophies. Nietzsche despised utilitarianism. And so here we see that he's giving priority to cultural form. And he's, uh, so this is a dynamic understanding of race. It is obviously less dangerous than what racist contemporaries of Nietzsche, like Gobineau, were already defending. There were already many racist accounts in Nietzsche's time. And by the way, Nietzsche did not pay any attention to Gobineau. He wasn't interested in him. This is well documented by Nietzsche's scholarship. But I agree with uh, Nietzsche scholar Daniel Conway that uh, Nietzsche neither fully articulates nor adequately defends what he understands by race. He trades it at res facta, as something that is fashioned over time, uh, naturally, uh, uh, as a, under favorable, favorable conditions. But what is key is that, that he had a positive opinion on race mixing. We see this with the figure of the good European, who he qualifies as a mixed race. He considers them uh, key for cultural progress. And this figure, uh, the good Europeans, they are free spirits who, uh, ideally, according to Nietzsche, they have emancipated themselves from uh, national prejudices. And so Nietzsche says that uh, they've worked their way to purify from their metabolism atavistic episodic, uh, episodes of patriotism. So by this we know that he despises nationalism, that he despises uh, patriotism, and that he's instead arguing for uh, the, an intercultural coming together of different races in Europe. And this is just to try and describe what he meant by race. Uh, other scholars have uh, written important books 
on the uses and advantages on, and disadvantages of such an understanding of race for, for, for civil rights and critical race theory. So I'm just distinguishing. Uh, one thing is why Nietzsche meant by race, and another thing is whether that's an interesting account for today. There is a fantastic volume on critical affinities uh, titled uh, Nietzsche and African American Thought. It was edited by Jacqueline Scott and Todd Franklin in 2006. And that book is a good example of a critical dialogue between Nietzsche's philosophy and black studies for anyone wanting to learn more about a contemporary perspective on these takes. Yes, this is very interesting because it already tells us how different the ideas Nietzsche had about race or how he used the term race differ from uh, the way many people use it today in contemporary politics and elsewhere. But there are actually people in modern day politics and even the 20th century, but now I'm referring to particularly some uh, minority groups in the on the far right that pick up some of Nietzsche's writings that have to do with uh, good Europeans, the metaphor of the blonde beast, for example, human types, the thought of breathing that we've talked about to support sort of an ethno-nationalist or European slash white supremacist a political agenda. Does that make sense? I mean, to pick up some of Nietzsche's writings and use them with that purpose in mind? I mean, do you think that Nietzsche would be someone to support an agenda like that or argue in favor of something like that? Well, I, I think they're using the same uh, strategy as the Nazi regime. The Nazi, the Nazi regime printed short anthologies containing Nietzsche's supposed Nazi message. They clipped and quote only the, more, the most controversial slogans and fragments. And these anthologies did not indicate the editor's name. And this led readers to believe that they had been published by Nietzsche in that format. For example, under titles such as Judaism, Christianity, Germanity, and um, this is the same strategy. Likewise, today's supremacist readings clip and put together some sentences to fabricate the propaganda. And they usually focus on Nietzsche's latest works, Beyond Good and Evil, The Genealogy and Twilight of the Idols, because that's obviously where the animal imagery is full blown. But they are missing the point of why Nietzsche uses these terms, and especially the overall argument so I will say, uh, I will talk a bit about uh, the Blom Beast, mm -hmm. because with the Blom Beast, Nietzsche is criticizing the European civilizing process because uh, he considers that uh, it, it has manipulated and tamed people under the promise of a peaceful coexistence, the immunity paradigm that, we, that I mentioned before uh, concerning Esposito. So yeah. the question Nietzsche raised is at what cost and whether this civilizing process could have been carried out differently with other ideals, non aesthetic ideals, for example. And so obviously, the blonde beast can easily be misinterpreted as a Nazi slogan. But we must first consider that he only uses it in two passages, the first in the genealogy of the more of morals, and the second in the toilet of the idols. And reading those passages thoroughly, from beginning to end, mm -hmm. we see that he's questioning the relationship between nature and culture. He, because traditionally, philosophy has understood culture as something superior, something properly human, something that distinguishes us from animals which are inferior. And Nietzsche says, this leap from nature to culture has resulted in the oblivion of our animal forces. In fact, he speaks of this animal vigor that is necessary to be brave, to dare in life. So again, what is he saying? He's talking about our habits, how we lead our lives, about moral behaviors. He says we need this animal vigor to say only I can do this. That's the example, he says, that we need courage, that because we have broken up with, culture, with nature, we are no longer courageous. 
And so those are the mundane examples he uses. He's not talking about any supposed great replacement of the blonde beast, like today's fascist or anything like that. He's just saying that we have lost power over ourselves by losing touch with our body or our nature. And so why the term beast? Because he's uh, returning to a creature whose instincts are not repressed like barbarian populations. He includes the Greeks, his idolized Greeks. So the metaphor, it does not convey a supremacy topology. If anything, Nietzsche is criticizing his fellow Europeans, including the Germans. And so I think it's crucial that readers understand this uh, figure as part of Nietzsche's criticism, as I said, of the Christian moral tradition and the European process. And based on philological arguments that I won't enter into detail, some scholars argue that the blonde beast is a lion, like the lion from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, who symbolizes the free spirit. And other scholars point, uh, point at the possible influence, very possible influence, that he incorporated these, uh, you know, uh, blonde features from the trivial literature of his time which presented Aryans as blonde hair, blue-eyed. And so this would, of course, support the association of Nietzsche with the Germanic stereotype. In any case, Nietzsche clearly pick up, picked up the, the imagery from his environment. And he might have chosen a bat if he had been from Valencia like me. But my point is, let's look at the message. What is he meaning by this? And also the fact that he does not uh, reserve this metaphor to Germans. He includes, uh, he says, the warriors of all ancient aristocracies. He says the Roman, Arab, Germanic, Japanese aristocracies, the heroes of Homer, again, the Greeks. He says the Scandinavian Vikings, those were obviously blonde. But the main takeaway should be that the blonde beast is, does not have a material content as a model to imitate. It's not a model to imitate. It's not a picture of what a human being should be like or look like. It has a critical purpose. It's a, hyper, a hyperbole representing ancient strength and, and virtue against what he considers to be the lukewarm values of modernity. And so Nietzsche criticized that the beast has been domesticated and sickened through morality and has developed a bad conscience. But, uh, and likewise, there are numerous passages in which he criticizes nationalism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, which he considered the sickness of his century. And I think a crucial uh, aphorism, it's an aphorism, it's human to human 475, there he condemns, I quote, the literary indecency of leading the Jews to the sacrificial slaughter as scapegoats for every possible public or private misfortune. So he's foreseeing what later, obviously later happened in the, at the Holocaust. But then uh, this passage is, is, uh, is interesting because we see how Nietzsche always combines uh, praise and criticism because after this a fierce critique of anti-Semitism, he, con he continues with a series of comments that are a perfect example of how Nietzsche very clumsily combined uh, extreme praise of Jewish people with horrible stereotypes. Because uh, he, he says that we owe them, we have to thank them, Jewish people, for the noblest human being, Christ, the purest sage, Spinoza, the mightiest book, and the most efficacious moral code of the world. So this huge praise, but in between these two comments, he has made a horrible uh, comment portrayal criticizing the youthful stock exchange Jew. So with expressions like that, as I said, it, it's, it's all too easy. It's extremely easy for propagandists to just clip the terrible stereotype of Jewish people and forget the, the first sentence in which he fiercely condemns anti-Semitism and the final praise on their cultural legacies. And likewise, there is a, another uh, section that is uh, provoking a lot of discussion uh, in, the, in Beyond Good and Evil. 
he fantasizes about breeding a new caste to rule over Europe, and he suggests to match the aristocratic officers from Brandenburg, so Germans, and Jewish woman, women, because he says this will be a cross between the art of command and obedience and the genius of money and patience and a spirit and spiral in a spirituality so again he's he's portraying jewish women as having a, as having the genius of money again this association from with between jewish people and money patience spirit spirituality and so this passage has not farewell at all because it now sounds like eugenics scholars don't like this passage at all but one thing is clear, he meant praise. He meant praise for their respective qualities. Had he been anti-Semitic, he would not have suggested such a pairing, but he was just clumsy like that. So my position, I think uh, Nietzsche's fault is that he used a lot of stereotypes regarding women, Jewish people, black people too. And so he's shooting himself in the foot. He says things inexcusable. For example, he praised black, pe black people's alleged superior capacity to endure pain compared to European softness. He's praising uh, black people, but he's using a horrible stereotype of, uh, 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 a false uh, uh, idea, obviously, and uh, connecting them with animality, uh, considering all the uh, uh, horrible consequences that such an association has historically had for black people. So he had good intentions, despite his foolishness. So my, my advice is always to read, carefully read the text in full. There is always a middle ground between uh, apologetic readings, absolving Nietzsche of all responsibility, and supremacist racist readings. We should not absolve Nietzsche of all responsibility for many of his incredible, horrible ideas and inappropriate notions. But still, it does not make sense to use him as a scapegoat and fully condemn him as a philosopher for a wider context. That's what I think. We can all discern what we want to take away and learn from Nietzsche. And it's not those stereotypes. No serious Nietzsche scholar reads Nietzsche to find these stereotypes. No, they're interested in genealogy and nihilism, concepts such as the paths of distance. So, I think the answer requires common sense, the solution, I mean. And still on the topic of race, uh, tell us about the process of incorporation. I mean, I'm not going to try to pronounce the German term for it because I'm going to butcher it for sure. <laughs> but tell us about incorporation and how it applies to race as Nietzsche understood it. That's a great question. So. Uh, this idea of incorporation has uh, sparked a lot of interest in the scholarship. I think it is deeply linked to breeding, but it is obviously a friendlier word. And what is significant about this term is that uh, uh, in German it's Einverleibung, it has Leib in it, it has the body in it. And even in English, it retains the corp, the Latin root for body. So uh, it's a very nice word. Sometimes it is translated by assimilation, but I think it's crucial to stress the bodily dimension in it and use incorporation. So this is a concept that Nietzsche starts using in 1881. In modern terms, we would say that incorporation is a process of biological assimilation of cultural phenomena. So for example, a conscious action requiring Will, willpower over time becomes instinctive, unconscious, automatic. And there comes a time when taste and judgment are incorporated and they become our instincts and they arise spontaneously without stimulation, without a, a trigger, that's the word. And so Nietzsche says that our ways of life, our habits, our instincts are the result of this long process of cultivation and incorporations. And instincts are at the root of this process. But Nietzsche understands instincts in a very particular way. For example, uh, instincts are the sources of our behavior, but they're not innate or fixed, as we might now think. They have been incorporated, first by coercion, 
for example, for evolutionary and adaptive pressures. Nietzsche says, for example, in the gay science 111, I already quote this, that treating similar things as identical, we have incorporated that by, by coercion. If, I, if I'm in danger, uh, if I'm uh, uh, in, uh, with a wild animal, I don't have time to think, oh, is this wild animal like all the other wild animals that I've confronted in my life? I mean, am I in danger or is it different? No, we treat similar things as identical and we have incorporated this by coercion. So it has, firstly, uh, evolutionary perspective. Then also by custom, we incorporate our habits, the habits of our family, something as mundane as uh, when, do we eat, when do we eat, what do we eat, for example. And so with all these uh, habits, we develop natural inclinations towards these behaviors. And so when we repeatedly put into practice our values, we incorporate it over time and we no longer have to think about them. They become second nature. We're spontaneously polite with other people. We have good manners at the table. We work hard. We stop having a hard time waking up in the morning, things like that. So uh, it's a positive process, but, it's, uh, but it can also be negative. It's worse for good and evil, like an ill, like uh, like uh, biopolitics. It works the same way in the opposite direction with vices. So for example, if for any reason, we consciously develop an aversion to risk, we will naturally avoid any danger. And we will unconsciously, this is the issue, unconsciously, we will try to blend with the group. And the point is that incorporated habits and values become automatic. That's why Nietzsche calls them instincts. And that's what the stake here, unconscious behaviors. And they regulate our behavior with much greater force and certainty than mere reasoning. Nietzsche is saying these instincts are way more powerful in forming and shaping people than any treatise in philosophy, than uh, Kant's critique of practical reason, for example. No, no, no. We need to uh, look at the instincts and try to change them. So, because uh, it's very interesting how Nietzsche understands these instincts. He thinks of them as points of view from which we develop our interpretations. And, that, and, and for this reason, a particular point of view teaches us something about who holds that view. A person's value reveals something, Nietzsche says, about the constitution of their soul, about their needs, uh, the, the, his conditions of life because interpretations are symptomatic of physiological phenomena. That's a key idea of genealogy. They attest to the state of the interpreting body. So that's why uh, we find these striking expressions in Nietzsche, these flamboyant claims saying Socrates was sick and he wanted to die. That's why he, there is all this philosophical talk in terms of health and illness, because what he meant is that for Socrates to defend his ascetic philosophy, he must have been sick. That's something, <laughs> no, that's, that's the idea, you know? Also when he says, we often see this meme and, uh, on the internet, what's the problem of Socrates? He was ugly, of course, because it reflected, it reflected his ideas, his ugly ideas, his disregard for beauty and all of that. So uh, to understand this, I think that, for example, Eric Blondel, in his book, Nietzsche, Genealogy, the Body, this has been translated to English and has had quite a lot of success. So he asks, is it Christianity that weakens the body or is it the weak body that produced Christianity? What came first? And in Nietzsche's case, it's both because it's a circular structure and that's why it's possible to intervene. It's a dynamic process that can change. And that's why Nietzsche contends in the prologue to the genealogy that we can study morality as a cause and a sickness, but also on the opposite side, as a symptom and as a remedy. And so regarding race, there is a well-known passage in Beyond Good and Evil, it's uh, 264, uh, it reads, it is in no way possible for a person not to have in his body the qualities and preferences of his parents and ancestors whatever appearances say. That is the problem of race." End of quote. So of course, this is very striking. And so this means that the so-called problem of race for Nietzsche, to a large extent, is the issue of heredity. 
the, the, uh, our bodily traits, our habits, our values, how they're transmitted, how they're maintained in culture. So here again, race our bodies and souls with the same demands. And some interpreters have read this passage as strong biological determinism, but I don't think that's the case. I think such a reading would contradict all Nietzschean hopes of free spirits, good Europeans, higher men, Yuvar men, and so on. I think uh, Nietzsche is simply stressing that any change will take a long time to take place, will take a long time to be incorporated. That is one of the key ideas also behind the notion of breeding. Nietzsche considers that education and intellectual tr uh, training, what the Germans always call Bildung, formation, that only works short term. And so Nietzsche often uses education to refer to the lifespan of a person or at most a generation while breeding or he race entail a transgenerational perspective. And this is shown, for example, when he writes that German education amounts to nothing. Why? Because uh, according to Nietzsche, of course, German education only pays attention to matters of erudition or instruction, it, it loses sight of the body, of the, of the organic function that, in Nietzsche's view, defines our values and habits. So the possibility of modifying a culture, family, society over a single lifetime is minimal. It's minimal compared to the influence of millennia of Christian breeding. That's why uh, a mere awareness will not liberate us. That's why the critic of practical reason, that's not gonna change us. Because Nietzsche says values that have been incorporated as living conditions for centuries by a long educational tradition, they do not disappear with the sheer force of theoretical arguments. We have incorporated their content and we experience, it, we, we experience, it, sorry, we experience them as needs. As I said, there's a space for change in the cultural realm. It's, it's primarily a matter of educating our bodies and changing our values. And so just to close off this section of the interview about race, uh, Nietzsche also has this idea of Uber Rasse and uh, sort of a call to overcome race. Could you tell us about that? Yes, thank you. Yes, I, uh, I, there was a chapter in my thesis that I've obviously dedicated to race and section on this concept. We need to be mindful that this term of Ubarrasse only appears in one posthumous fragment from 84. It's the fragment 25462, in case there's any Nietzsche scholar listening. So uh, it only appears once in a posthumous fragment, which is uh, Nietzsche's private notebooks. So it doesn't have a strong force, but uh, any interpretation will necessarily entail some speculation, mine or, or any other person's. What follows is my attempt to make sense of it. So now that the disclaimer is gone, uh, we have already established that there is no cult to an alleged original state of the race in Nietzsche. The race is a product of uh, multiple factors, environmental, cultural, political, and a greater mix of races results in new kinds of human beings with greater complexity of drives. That's why Nietzsche praises the mix of races because instead of having uh, one simple uh, and fixed type of human being, we have multiple types coming together, diversifying their cultural references, their values, experimenting, this is a very Nietzschean idea. So in this fragment that I just referenced uh, on the Übergasse, uh, Nietzsche uses we to refer to he and his readers, or maybe his contemporary humans. And he says, we are the heirs of generations who have lived under the most diverse conditions of existence. So we, as Europeans or whatever, uh, have within us a plurality of instincts. And there is also uh, many characters, many roles, instead of a single role. And so the thing is that uh, while performing roles, habits, morals, uh, they're obviously reinforced. Our, our character, our features that are reinforced. And he writes, 
that that's how a race emerges in the long run, assuming that the environment does not change. When we perform the same task over time, over a large uh, period of time, in the same environment, that's when what we see as physically as a race appears. And that's very much in line with what, with what he wrote in Beyond Good and Evil, in stating that people who live together for extended periods of time become similar and identified, uh, identifiable as a people, as a folk. So again, Nietzsche does not emphasize blood. He says emphasizing shared experience. So the note on Ibarrasse continues by stating the opposite situation. So we've spoken about a group of human beings living together and, and closed, doing the same ta uh, single task for a long period of time. But he says, when there is a change of scenario or environment, that people or that race generally develop other functional properties because they need to adapt to a different environment. And this adjustment requires strength. It requires force. It requires, for example, developing new talents. And after writing all of this praise of how we're strong because we can adapt, we can flourish in multiple environments, he concludes, the European, such a supra race, Ibagase, and he says, likewise, the Jew, he's ultimately a dominant species, very different from the simple Asian races, which had not changed their environment. So again, he's praising the Jewish people because of, for uh, historical reasons that maybe Nietzsche chose to uh, ignore. They have lived in, uh, in you know, many different uh, places in countries and cultures. So based on the overall fragment, an Ubagasse, a supra race, has managed to live successfully in diverse conditions. It has diverse instincts. Nowadays, we will say talents, inclinations, dispositions. It has the power to adjust to different environments. And therefore, uh, they have overcome any dependency on a specific environment. And I think uh, the terms here, the, the whole message is positive because it entails a positive element of transgression. If we see, if we look at how Nietzsche uses Uba, in other words, Uba Mensch, also Uba Europeisch, Supra European, it always designates something that can be overpassed and that maybe even should be surpassed, overcome. So if Nietzsche first states in the fragment that the race emerges through the repetition of roles and tasks in a specific environment, and then continues by saying that when the environment changes, when we change our, our uh, environment, people are forced to adjust and change as well. And that has been the case for Europeans and the Jewish people. Then Ubarase entails, at least to some extent, to a dissolution of the race, of the strong character that could be perceived in the regional scenario of a singular people living together for a specific period of time because this Ubagas instead has a wider range of talents. In fact, in Beyond Good and Evil and in the genealogy, Nietzsche repeatedly wrote that Christianity <laughs> brought about the worsening of the European grace and its health. So one can naturally contest these claims against Christianity, but my point is that on these premises, it is clear that for Nietzsche, mixing races and what he understood by races, which ha we have seen, it's just cultures or ethnicities. This allows for cultivating other perspectives and fostering relations between communities. And Nietzsche believed that uh, different peoples have acquired different talents through their respective histories. And so their descendants could benefit from uh, both capitals, from uh, the knowledge of all those communities. So in my view, this is the most plausible interpretation of the Ubagasse words. They are strong enough to stand over any specific environment uh, and they enjoy more freedom in that sense. And uh, I think that uh, Nietzsche wanted humanity to take the reins of its destiny and overcome social divisions such as nation and race. And there are two texts that support these ideas. This, this idea that Nietzsche was aware 
that uh, this an, an an essentialist idea of race or um, or, or, or of nation uh, of an of an idea of nation when they are essentialized or considered as goods in it in themselves they act as brakes on human development so there are two texts that support this idea the first one is the proclamation of uh, great politics it's a very well known posthumous fragment so again it's not published uh, text but it clearly shows uh, it, it has a lot of word like vocabulary and that's why many scholars don't like it at all <laughs> but i it, i think it shows that the wars nietzsche speaks about they're not armed conflicts they're not territorial seizure they are battle, battles for intellectual dominance around the very image of what it means to be human and, and the models available from for different type of humans and nietzsche says i bring war not between people. He says, I, I have no words to express my contempt for the abomin abominable politics of European dynasties. He says, war not between states. I bring the war that, that is introduced through all these absurd coincidences or accidentals, the German word is zufällig, so something random, the, the, these random things that are pe the people, folk, in this sense, class race so he's criticizing such random divisions because he thinks they should not determine the course of what he calls great politics that there is something more valuable uh, uh, beyond that that's the cultural product etc and uh, about this same war he wrote a letter to Georg Brandes a very good friend of his in December 88 saying if we win the war we will have in our hands the government of the earth, including world peace. So he's not talking about he wants world peace, let's say, and this is obviously Nietzsche on the verge of madness, but I think it's a beautiful death. And then he critiques the absurd boundaries of race, nation, and class. Instead, he said, instead of these absurd boundaries, only the hierarchy among human beings from individual to individual will persist. So race should not be the country. Let's look at the person. Let's look at the disposition, the talent, the morals, the, uh, their habits. So my interpretation, this Übergasse thing, is that uh, this Nietzsche thought, I think it's clear, that divisions such as race or nationalism should be overcome or at least become more fluid because they were not the aim of Nietzsche's cultural wars or projects. Great, so uh, changing topics now, uh, in Nietzsche's philosophy, apparently the point of view of value is more fundamental than the point of view of truth. So what does that mean exactly? Yes. And, and that's a, a beautiful quote. So the, the thing is that Nietzsche considers that uh, the traditional philosophical goal of searching for representational truth searching for truth, uh, neglects uh, uh, a more important task, the more profound presence of ideas and va uh, values. And so uh, that it, its values, uh, values are the thing that condition and uh, how we think. And, that's, and so values replace the centrality of truth. And those values are questioned and evaluated based on how they shape or form the human being. For example, the knowledge provided by genealogy allows us to reinterpret historical transformations as breeding processes and, and problematize the living conditions that sustain each cultural form. So uh, var values are no longer perceived as uh, immutable realities or as things themselves or something like that. They are instruments of self-preservation of specific human groups. And there are multiple texts that convey this idea. For example, Gay Science 345, Nietzsche says, a morality could have a reason arisen from an error. Even with that knowledge, the knowledge that it is a mistake, the problem of its value will not have even touched upon. So, which means neither truth or falsity are decisive criteria. So how do we choose among values? How can we distinguish uh, what Nietzsche says calls the value of values? So, 
the key passage on, on this is Beyond with an Evil, section 4. He writes, we do not consider the falsity of a judgment in itself an objection to a judgment. So the falsity is not a, uh, as an objection to the judgment in question. This is perhaps where our new language will sound most foreign. So he's aware that all of this will sound very striking to any reader. The question is how far the judgment promotes and preserves life, how well it preserves and perhaps even cultivates the type. Here there is, there is Artzuchten, so again, it's the Zuchten as a verb. Here was translated, I think it's, this is Judith Norman's translation uh, by cultivation. So what does he mean by this? I think that to understand this, uh, the comparison with Christianity is very helpful. So, for example, rational truth was not necessary for Christian values to succeed. In fact, people with faith are not interested in questions such as the existence of God. So, but Christian values have served the interest of, Nietzsche says, specific types of people who have then been able to cultivate and perpetuate their forms of power or their ways of life, okay? So Nietzsche says, Christianity did not need to demonstrate its truth to succeed. And so any alternative to Christian values does not need to be demonstrated as truth either. It should only be justified uh, and proven as a more appropriate perspective, as a better perspective for human development. So truth is not a criteria. Nietzsche suggests that uh, we should evaluate values based on the space they open up for creation, for freedom. But the problem is that, uh, uh, like we're talking with the case of uh, incorporation, millennia of Christian breeding cannot be erased overnight. So it, it is only possible to work and transform them so that uh, second nature becomes first nature. This is uh, Nietzsche's words. And this is also a, a terminology that he uh, that originates in Plato in the Republic, and Nietzsche uh, also also a Platonic uh, terminology that is uh, very like the scholarship because it sounds way better than reading. So another thing I would like to ask you about is the genealogical method. So Nietzsche wrote uh, the genealogy of morals. What is the genealogical method about? So, uh, contemporary philosophy considers genealogy uh, to be an anti-essentialist method for mostly social and political critique, also epistemological critique, obviously, but for example, against sexist, classist, racist prejudices. And genealogy has uh, been incorporated and established as a narrative method. So uh, it has succeeded in philosophy. It's a method whose goal is to describe how a belief, a concept, a value, or a practice, sometimes oppressive, how it emerged and arrived uh, until our time and persisted until our time. Mm -hmm. So, but in Nietzsche's sense, genealogy is twofold. So it is partly a history of the genesis of thought. This is very worthy, but it's the terms he uses uh, because of the evolutionary inspiration. So it is par partly a history of uh, morals, for example, the genesis of thought. Um, it's, it's a method to obtain knowledge about how different cultures and ideas are created and maintained. But for Nietzsche, uh, it primarily questions the value of our values, the idea, the practices, the, uh, our, our practices, our institutions like the church, for example, Okay, so uh, it is evident that Nietzsche did not coin the term genealogy. It is a term that exists philosophy by far. We can think about mm -hmm. uh, the genealogical uh, research of a naturalist, a genealogical tree of a, or of a family. This goes very much in line with all Nietzschean discussion of heredity. And so this naturalistic connotation has been lost, I think, in many posterior genealogies, not all of them, for example, uh, feminists of sexual difference, when they speak of feminine genealogies, they are following this understanding of the uh, connection with the mother, the grandmother. But mm -hmm. for the rest of philosophy, 
this naturalistic connotation has been lost and it was in Nietzsche. This was in Nietzsche because uh, this is obviously a, a Darwinian inspiration. Darwin considered all classifications to be genealogical. This was in line with his ramified view of evolution. So the only possible arrangement of organic beings that have lived on Earth is genealogical. And what is interesting and shared by Nietzsche is that both of them, Darwin and Nietzsche, were more interested uh, in the processes, the sequences, the becoming, than in finding a supposed stable origin or a first cause, because that point is non-existent. Then it's not like we're going to learn the, the point in which the Homo sapiens arose now. And for Nietzsche, it's, it's not about finding out when did this, uh, uh, when did uh, Christian Valles arise? No, that's not the point. Okay, let's study all the becoming, how it has been maintained, the power of transmission that that genealogical tree has to arrive until us. And so uh, I think uh, Nietzsche's understanding of genealogy presupposes these evolutionary connotations. But uh, this is, and, and this is an essential consequence for Zuchtung of breathing. Nietzsche learned to emphasize the process of breathing or selection itself. So it is essential to remember what I said at the beginning, that Zuchtung, uh, I, at the time of Nietzsche, it was uh, temporarily used as a translation for natural selection. And what defines Zuchtung is the process itself. It's not the ends. The ends of the breathing process, it can be multiple, different, depending on the cultures. It can be the, it's different if it's Spanish people, the Greeks, the Germans, uh, the Christian taming, the, all of those are different. So what defines Zuchtung is the process, like genealogy. It's not the end. The end can be positive or negative. So Nietzsche's originality lies in raising this awareness that human societies genealogically develop some instincts or characteristics to the detriment of others. And that's why uh, learning about our history, learning about our uh, other cultures, uh, what we have lost in our path, maybe uh, th that uh, is an opportunity to learn about other alternatives, other alternative values that could be more suitable for, for example, our life's project. But uh, Nietzsche claimed, this, here comes the big difference with uh, Darwinism, Nietzsche claimed that Darwin forgot the spirit. This is a quote, he forgot the spirit. But why? because he limited himself to the notion of this natural selection, and he did not analyze uh, the axolo axiological questioning, the axiological inquiry, the, this critical questioning of uh, the value of our values, what they are and what is their worth. And for these shortcomings, Nietzsche criticizes not only Darwin, but mostly social Darwinists, especially Herbert Spencer, Jean-Marie Bouillot, Paul Re, who was Prussian, that he called him the English, to associate them with the evolutionary. So and Nietzsche shares many things with them. For example, a rejection of metaphysics, of essentialisms, and the, this interest in discovering the extra moral or, origin of morality. But and, uh, uh, they were, their genealogy is not a true genealogy. That's Nietzsche's point. And I think it's important to remember this. This explains why uh, Nietzsche praises them at the beginning of, of the genealogy. The book begins with the praise of these authors, of these genealogies, but the critique immediately follows. Why? Because he, these social Darwinians have taken for granted their values and they, they, they are develop a history of morality, but they do not question the value of their values, which is, they have a very particular agenda, mostly altruism. And so uh, Nietzsche confronts this social evolutionism because he considers that they are trying to legitimize the same values of Christianity with a new scientific code or storyline. So uh, because according to these accounts, obviously, there is no supernatural or celestial authority but there are biological evolutionary imperatives that command the same Christian values that Nietzsche despised. And so uh, 
these social Darwinists explain the emergence of altruistic morality via social uh, utility. Thus, they exercise the same function as Christianity. They are acting as what Nietzsche called a shadow of God. And Nietzsche uh, repeatedly insisted that the origin of a tradition or a value, for example, in prehistoric times, whatever use uh, altruism was had when we live in a tribe, <laughs> the, the, the origin and the current utility are two separate matters. Whatever use that thing originally had is not uh, an argument, does not support at all. It is not decisive to decide what we do with that value today, to evaluate the value of that value. So that's what he's uh, insisting, to be critical, that those historians, that the, those English did not dare to question the status of their values. And that's the radicalization that is indispensable for an authentic uh, genealogy in Nietzsche's case. So at a certain point, you mentioned there again the concept of Zustung. And going back to it just for a second, how does it apply to an analysis of culture and the character of morals, since we're talking here about the genealogy of morals again? Thank you, Ricardo. I will try to be briefer now. So <laughs> in broad strokes, we can define uh, Zustung breathing as a system of acculturation consisting of feedback loops between nature and culture, what we talk about uh, regarding incorporation, that our social environment, education, cultural systems, they play a huge role in shaping our personalities and mm -hmm. conditioning people's action. And this type of idea uh, is not that extreme, formulated like that at least. In fact, John Rawls, the most significant liberal philosopher of the 20th century wrote in political liberalism that any system of social instit institutions limits the values it can admit. So that it, some selection must be made. So he's recognizing some selections must be made from the full range of moral and political values that might be realized. So this was a quote from Rawls, but the big difference in Nietzsche's originality is to stress what is truly at stake here. What is the ultimate consequence of these selections? Anyone can agree that moral, religious, political values shape characters. They form how we live who, and ultimately who we are. And Nietzsche's awareness is that this is a physiological question. And that's what he means when he characterizes morals and religions, morals and religions as, I quote, the principle means by which one can make of human beings whatever one wants. It's not a true quote. I think it's a great quote. So he's saying that we're all being shaped, bred, raised, configured by, by our morals, our religions, nationalities, habits. So Nietzsche's originality is that he challenges these concealed selection principles from other moral perspectives, and he himself he's compelled to be selective. And this also leads me to uh, speak a bit about the difference between breeding and education. Why are they not synonyms? Why we should not uh, translate a Zuchton by education? The first one is like breeding, like any other Nietzschean expression such as herd, like a herd of sheep. Yeah. Nietzsche considers that they contribute to placing humans within the animal kingdom. This is where our, his insights happen to lie. This is what he writes in Beyond Good and Evil. And so he's, he's, he, we're concealing his message by using non-animal terms. And the second is that, as I say, uh, uh, the usual vocabulary of education conceals what is at stake with education. That Nietzsche says that what we consider innocent terms conceal what education actually does breed particular, particular types of humans that are different in each culture. So overall, uh, Nietzsche understood morality as the discipline and breeding of a certain type of man with the purpose of changing or improving them. And improving, uh, this is a term that Nietzsche uh, used to write in quotes, quotation 
Marx to display his skepticism, like in the Twilight of the Idols, the chapter is called The Improvers of Humanity, because they're not really improving humanity. So I've already spoken about the genealogy of the morals. There, as I've said, uh, Nietzsche uses breathing mostly uh, as a critical tool. It's a, a tool, a conceptual tool to critically analyze the European civil civilizing process. And that connects with his later critique of improvement. Nietzsche says that morality has historically presented itself in two variants, taming and morality as, as taming and morality as breeding. And so there, uh, and, and I want to stress, some people say that this, it's a, a crucial uh, dif differentiation. There, Nietzsche presents, uh, characterizes Christianity as a taming. But in the genealogy, he characterizes Christianity as the breeding of a gregarious animal. So in my opinion, uh, all tamings are breedings, but not all breedings are taming. So taming is a, speci is a specific group or type of breeding. What is the difference? So uh, what Nietzsche is doing in the Toilet of the Idols is uh, praising uh, the Code of Manu because it sanctifies different types of humans. There, there is a, uh, the warrior, the priest, uh, the, the artisans, the workers. And so that for Nietzsche is better that uh, the homogeneous type same type of Christianity. But uh, none of those examples represent Nietzsche's ideal. Nietzsche is not advocating for the Code of Manu. Uh, the Code of Manu only wins by default. This is important because some people are over uh, around the world are thinking <laughs> that Nietzsche is the Code of Manu. Definitely not. In the, in the Antichrist, Nietzsche is always choosing different examples to against which Christianity always loses. So it's just to critique Christianity. So, the chapter, The Improvers of Humanity, condemns that humanity became moral in a fundamentally immoral process. That's what he uh, he's stressing. And he also uses a very interesting uh, metaphor of <coughs> sorry, morality as menagerie, as a wild zoo of beasts. He says each community or, or state is a zoo or, of wild beasts. And the fear of punishment and shame are the bars that prevents us, the beast, from mutilating each other. The fear of punishment. And, and, and that's something that uh, clearly distinguishes Nietzsche from the social Darwinians. Uh, Nietzsche doesn't think about uh, the emergence of morality through uh, utility or happiness, no, fear. Fear is the mainspring motive to tyrannically impose ways of being. And so that's what he wants to convey that there is hardly any difference between the improvement of animals by humans and the improvement of human beings by other human beings. But in both cases, it's an alleged improvement. It's, it's just a type that is supposedly better suited to a given community, for example, like a European societies. And Nietzsche uh, talks about all the normative framework, framework of culture, for example, criminal law, uh, uh, it doesn't matter if I make a promise and then I forget about it. The uh, law will come <laughs> and remind me that I made that promise and they will punish me if they forget about it. That's how responsibility is instilled. That's why uh, Nietzsche uh, opens the second treatise of the genealogy saying that uh, uh, Christianity breeds an animal with the prerogative of making promises. Or European culture in general. So uh, I'm going to finish. The thing is that there, there is a critical side of in the sense that breeding is an explanatory category, but at the same time, there is an appeal to action to become autonomous. There, is, there are positive sense of breeding. Um, uh, Nietzsche, instead of autonomous, prefers to say a self-legislator, because autonomous sounds very Kantian. But the thing is that he's uh, calling people to become an individual person, to emancipate themselves from the herd. And there is also a political, a social collective dimension within great politics. So it's not just an individual target. Overall, uh, Nietzsche encourages people to take charge, to take power over them, to become aware that these processes are happening with or without our consent and then they're 
conditioning our formation and constitution. So, breeding is twofold because there is a critic, crucial critical sense, mainly linked to the criticism of European civilizing process, but there is also a programmatic sense of taking hold of these processes and the moral of social formation and redirecting them to our other ends. Those ends can be multiple and divide and and diverse. I think that uh, the places where this uh, positive message of breeding uh, is most clearly shown is obviously beyond good and evil, and the third section of the Antichrist. That's where uh, Nietzsche implores that this process should become dependent on our human will. So not just some uh, evolutionary random process. No, it should be dependent on our human will. So to repropriate ourselves of our possibilities, that instead of merely enduring change, we should change voluntarily and desire it as part of what he calls our own will to power. And that's the task that uh, he uh, uh, designates for future philosophers in Beyond Good and Evil 61, he says, to interpret the world, the world in a way that opens up possibilities for changing it. So, and I will end with this comment. I think it, it is very often objective, uh, objected to Nietzsche that this future oriented task that his whole uh, talk of affirmative values, vitalist values, what is that? that it is too indefinite and too vague to be materialized. But I think that this openness for me, it's an advantage because it is plural. It shows that he's not imposing an, an uh, authoritative process, a, a, a tyrannical project. Nietzsche does not say that we should go around telling others what ideal of life they should follow. He's clear that, for example, the last man will also return eternally, that there will be, there will always be people with what he calls slave morality or who will choose a hedonistic way of life. That's not the problem. The problem for him is when uh, that's the hegemonic way of living. So I think that's the, the key issue. <laughs> okay, so I have one last question for you then. And we've been talking about how some of Nietzsche's ideas get get appropriated by contemporary political movements and how they relate to them, at least to some extent. So about the notion of the Ubermensch, uh, does it relate in any way to contemporary transhumanist ideas? That's a fantastic question to end. Okay, so <laughs> in fact, I dedicated my, my la the last chapter of my thesis to this, and it's also published in the journal in Spanish, so for whoever reads Spanish and uh, showing the partiality of this plea of so-called Nietzschean transhumanism. So for most of the transhumanist stream movement, uh, Nietzsche is just a marginal figure. At best, it's just a source for catchy uh, metaphors and quotes, because most transhumanists uh, ascribe to utilitarianism some sort of utilitarianism. And we already know what Nietzsche thought of utilitarianism and their green pasture idea of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a quote from Beyond Good and Evil. That's my favorite book, if it doesn't show enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but there is obviously a, a scholar in particular, who is Stefan Sorner. He's the author who has insisted the most on a transhumanist reading of Nietzsche, and he has focused on two central claims. The first is that uh, Nietzsche today will be a transhumanist. That's the claim. And the second is that Nietzsche uh, inspired uh, transhumanism as a movement, and thus transhumanism could be considered a Nietzschean movement. And this is a claim that he shares with Max Moore. Max Moore says, uh, Nietzsche inspired me very much. I'm a key figure of transhumanism. Therefore, uh, transhumanism has some Nietzsche inside. That's what he says. <laughs> so, but their claim ultimately is that Nietzsche would commit himself to this movement aiming to uh, technologically transform the human being to a supposed higher level with 
cutting edge uh, science and technologies. But nowhere does Nietzsche point to the use of science to achieve the advent of the overhuman. So Sochner uh, interpreted the overhuman evolutionarily in terms of steps, evolutionary steps. Uh, he argues that the environment would be a bridge towards a, a future post-human species. And the textual basis for this is the prologue of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where uh, Zarathustra says that the human is a bridge and not a goal. First of all, we should keep in mind that Zarathustra is not Nietzsche. Zarathustra is just a character. And then secondly, uh, the Ubermensch is not a separate or, or, or a different biological species. This is something that Nietzsche openly clarifies in writings like in books like Ecce Homo, because Nietzsche was already aware that readers were misinterpreting the Ubermensch in these Darwinian terms. Nietzsche wrote in uh, 1888, what, what type, what, sorry, what type will one day replace humanity? Question. But this is nothing more than Darwinian ideology as if species have never been replaced. What interests me is the problem of a hierarchy between human types that always have existed and that will always exist. He differentiates between an ascending type of life and another of decline. So the key issue for Nietzsche is our, our way of life, what we do with our life, what values do we uh, put in practice, how they shape us. And so in, Nietzsche says, that this stronger type has already existed quite often. There have, there have been, uh, you know, uh, these ideas of uh, exceptional men, genius, etc. Uh, according to Nietzsche, they have existed, but as a fortunate case, as an exception, never as something wanted. So that's the issue for him. The issue for him is not to create a technologically enhanced human, but that uh, when uh, to foster greatness, and when greatness arrives, to, to take care of it, to cultivate it, not to let it uh, perish, not to let, let it themselves go, that it doesn't get uh, lost in, for example, uh, mass movements or something like that. So it's about a, a notion of life, and the Ubermatch is a, is a figure of an alternative way of life and values. In, in th uh, the, it personifies a critique of Western culture. And the counterexample, the very clear counterexample, is the last human, whose lifestyle is decadent, adaptative, coward, ascetic. And what Nietzsche meant, meant is that with the Übermensch is a counter image to this mentality, a more individuated uh, ethical approach to life. And that it, it, it will not arise evolutionarily as a type. Yet, Zarathustra claims, again, it's Zarathustra, not Nietzsche, that the advent must be willed, that means desired and promoted with ideals, with vitalist ideas and particular life forms. And I think it's also interesting to remember that beyond the book Zarathustra, so apart from Zarathustra, the overhuman is not so much a figure or a future person to come, it's a horizon. Nietzsche writes übermenschliches, so it's it's something uh, quite more indefinite, so a, a horizon that hopefully we are approaching it. That's not the person that's going to, to save us, and so uh, it lacks definite substance. And I, as already said, I, I think this is a positive quality that we don't have a specific sense of substance in Nietzsche's teachings, but uh, that it opens space. I think that's positive. It's not about the species, but about singular forms of life, a new Uber or over what has been before. And so uh, I also think that uh, many transhumanist accounts underplay the role of community in developing the Ubermensch, like they say, as if uh, one person is going to become a human man. No, it's not about that. It's, it's not an individual metamorphosis, I think. I think because it, it might be, but the thing is that the advent requires a culture, a soil, and a community of different types that positively influence each other. 
we see this when uh, in, 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 in Zarathustra and also with uh, in Beyond Good and Evil with the task that he assigns to philosophers, etc. So uh, it embodies an eminent ethic of self-shaping. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the problem, in my opinion, is that Sorgner has published many papers and books on Nietzsche and transhumanism, including a book titled A Plea for Nietzsche and Transhumanism. It's in German, but that's the title. So a plea for Nietzsche and transhumanism. He goes on and on talking about his Nietzsche and transhumanism. So my issue is that beyond these catchy metaphors, I don't think Nietzsche's philosophy has the necessary weight in Nietzsche's, uh, sorry, in Sorgner's uh, philosophy, thought, proposal, to merit to be qualified as Nietzsche. And I think, uh, for, for example, how he understands nihilism is not how Nietzsche understood nihilism. And um, many other examples that I developed uh, in the thesis and the article, someone wants to read that. And Sorgner is quite instrumental in affirming and rejecting Nietzsche whenever it interests him, especially to this defend himself from eugenical associations by fellow Germans like Jürgen Habermas, who despised Nietzsche. So then he said, oh no, Nietzsche, uh, he only had a cultural project in mind. And then in other cases, he says, oh no, Nietzsche spoke about breathing in some notebooks. So he's completely strategic. In any case, I think that Sorner has been moving on lately from uh, Nietzsche as a topic, which is good news. And <laughs> but uh, the lesson from this, I think that, uh, as I said at the beginning, Nietzsche scholars should be criti critical uh, towards these partial decontextualites and selective interpretations from people that project into Nietzsche, into Nietzsche an ideological framework that was alien to him. And this, this prompts a reflection of what does it mean to be Nietzschean? And to me, being Nietzschean means adopting a particular perspective that uh, with Nietzsche's concepts, with our, the legacy that he left that to us, and also defining oneself as a follower or a member of a school of thought, whether it's Aristotle, Kant, or, or Nietzsche, that does not provide any argumentative force to uh, the positions we defend. At most, it, it, it conveys that we adopt a perspective, and that, as I said, that, that we use Nietzsche's tools to analyze the world around us and articulate our, our ideas. And that's not what uh, Sorner does, in my opinion. And neither Nietzsche studies need transhumanism to retain some philosophical relevance, nor does transhumanism uh, need Nietzscheanism to justify itself argumentatively. And I think an important, with this I will end, uh, an interesting point of comparison is a posthuman scholar, not a transhuman, posthuman, Rosie Braidotti. Braidotti, she finds inspiration in uh, some of Nietzsche's ideas. For example, affirmation, embodiment, immanence. She, she consistently quotes Nietzsche, but she does not intend to portray Nietzsche as a posthuman, nor that she uh, instrumentalize Nietzsche's name or use him in the title of her books. So uh, Braidotti is aware that her interpretation is obviously extrinsic to Nietzsche, but she points to concrete aspects of Nietzsche's philosophy that she thinks are interesting and valuable, useful for her account of uh, critical posthumanism. So uh, I think that, it's, uh, that there are different ways to proceed, and, and that's the issue. We can obviously use uh, Nietzsche as a source of inspiration for contemporary philosophy, but we should refrain from uh, labeling Nietzsche and uh, instrumentalizing Nietzsche. That's my the idea that I would like to finish with. <laughs> Great. So, Marina, uh, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yes. Yeah, so I'm on in practically all the academic networks like academia.edu. I'm on Twitter. I'm on ResearchGate. I'm on Field Peoples, and I think you can easily find me with my name. And I have. Um, Many th some things, uh, for coming publication papers forthcoming in English. So because until now I have mostly published in Spanish. So if you are interested in my topics, please come join. And I, I've recently been part of a collective volume on uh, Nietzsche on women, 
a critique of truth of value uh, and values. It has been edited by Michael McNeil and published in Bolomington. So I encourage you to check it out and I'll see you over there. <laughs> Great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been really fun to talk to you and I hope to have you on again somewhere in the near future. So. Thank you, Ricardo. It's been a pleasure. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please do not forget to share, like, subscribe, comment. And to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Wintingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Eleni, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windiger, Rui Nassi, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavana, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Iag Nunes, Fergal Kusson, Halle Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Linhares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Oeira, Tom Hummel, Sardos France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegu, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, George Stéphanus, Chris Hill, Williamson, P Peter Walazin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Erringbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zool, Bar Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crawley, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, BR, Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, and Jonas Hurtner. A special thanks to my producers is our web Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Van Egden, Bernard Hugney, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alney Cortez, and Nick Golden. And to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codrian, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.